the 58 may raise. By the grace of God, it doesn't. Uh, and we shall continue to move forward. The medical profession, profession will provide all the medical care necessary, but sometimes it's um, people meet their demise outside of our control. So I'm hoping that number does not raise, uh, but today's number is 58. The fuel tanks. I'm going to read this narrative so my words do not get changed, but I want to provide you some information in reference to the fuel tanks. It is believed the fuel tanks were fired upon with intent. McCarran's leaders have, have safety protocols in place which they re-examine following any safety-related incident. The leaders have already contacted experts in fuel storage out of the abundance of caution. I am more than confident that they will immediately implement any changes or security augmentations <coughs> if they are so advised. It has, I have been advised there is a very low probability that aviation fuel could be ignited by gunfire and the tanks are outfitted for a continual release of vapors. So that is the situation of the fuel tanks. Any future information that needs to be provided, reference that, will be provided by um, the Public Information Office out of McCarran Airport. The dates of the 25th versus the 28th. Um, this was not breaking news, no matter who believed it to be so in this form. We were aware of the discrepancy of the 28th versus the 25th in the early parts of this investigation. What we weren't aware of is why the date of the 28th was utilized in the early portion of this, as I was provided this information as part of the person registered in the suspect's room. Uh, we have come to learn um, the suspect did occupy the room uh, on the 25th and the situation on how the room was uh, compensated or paid for had changed and the name as part of the registration had changed on the 28th uh, to include Mary Lou Danley. Uh, so that was the confusion associated with that. Uh, no matter what the perception is, whether we were uh, being non-transparent or we were attempting to be subversive is false. Um, I was acting on the information at the time I was provided it. The autopsy, um, yes, there has been an autopsy performed on Mr. Paddock or the suspect. Um, in the early evaluation, there was no abnormalities observed visually. Um, as a matter of practice in the forensic science, um, his brain has been um, shipped to a, a appropriate evaluation facility in order to take a microscopic evaluation of the brain. So the initial report that there was no abnormalities was a visual inspection of his brain. Um, so it's yet to be known whether there is any abnormalities to be presented at a later date. Now the timeline. Unfortunately, a great deal of my investigator's time has been preoccupied on this timeline. In the public space, the word incompetence has been brought forward and I am absolutely offended with that characterization. This is a very dynamic event, very big event. Thousands of people involved, humans involved in documentation. And every venue of information involved in this information, in this investigation. So, the information was obtained via security logs. Officer Campos himself, uh, body-worn cameras, hotel cameras, lock interrogation, my dispatch, LVMPD dispatch, hotel and private cameras, and interviews. 
So imagine bringing it all together to ensure that we are drawing an accurate picture. So I'll provide you a little more information on that. I still stand by the time of 2159, 959. It's important that you continue to listen to me. 959 is important. It wasn't inaccurate when I provided it to you. The circumstances associated with it is inaccurate, okay? I am very well aware of the MGM statement provided yesterday. I agree with their statement. I'm not in conflict with their statement. But what, here's what I will tell you. We were provided the time of 2159 as a human entry into a security log. Through investigation, we have determined that Mr. Campos had encountered the barricaded door adjacent to the suspect's door at approximately 2159. In his attempt to gain entry to the 32nd floor, he required him to ascend to another level, another level and eventually make access to the 32nd floor. He went to the doorway that he was dispatched to originally to address the open doorway. He mitigated that situation and subsequently received fire from the suspect. When you culminate that timeline associated from the initial 2159 to the 2205 timeline that we are still stand by as the initial volley of fire, um, Mr. Campos received his wounds in close proximity to 2205. He attempted to relay that information via uh, his radio and it was confirmed because he also relayed that information via his cell phone. So the timeline associated to both of those sources have been verified. 2205, the number that was provided earlier referenced uh, the, the majority of fire um, upon our community. We still stand by that time and that was done by the combination of different uh, sources that I listed for you earlier. 2217, 12 minutes. That is when our officers first arrived on the 32nd floor, 12 minutes. You are very well aware the suspect fired at approximately 10 minutes. Upon our arrival on the 32nd floor, the firing had ceased. We did not believe we had continually had an active shooter. Uh, at that point, we conducted evacuations of the rooms adjacent to the suspect's room, and you know the rest. So there is no conspiracy between the FBI, between LVMPD, and the MGM. Nobody is attempting to hide anything reference this investigation. The dynamics and the size of this investigation requires us to go through voluminous amounts of information in order to draw an accurate picture. My attempt, like I stated earlier, is to give you the information as I know it, unverified, to calm the public, not to establish a legal case. Everybody understand that? No question, sir. Now we're gonna get into future of the investigation. Um, I don't wanna put a percentage of responsibility associated with this investigation because it would not make sense, but I'm here to tell you we are standing hand in hand with the FBI in the continuance of this investigation. In the beginning throws of it, and in the continuance of it. Um, our portion at LVMPD has become contracted. My concern was the initial safety of the community, whether we had any other bad actors out there that we had to address, and I feel confident there are no other individuals um, intending to cause harm to our community associated with the one October event. Now it's become protracted, and that's where the FBI has their expertise. 
We are establishing the timeline of the suspect's life, his motivation, and everybody else associated with him throughout time. And it requires us to rely on the FBI's resources for that success. Nobody's acquiescing in my department to this. I am not acquiescing, and nor is the FBI coming in with a hammer and attempting to take over. This will continue to be a joint operation. With that being said, I want to give the opportunity for Aaron Rouse to provide some statements. Thank you, Sheriff. I am Aaron Rouse. I'm the special agent in charge for the FBI in Las Vegas. In support of our partner, from the beginning, we have established a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week command post with agents, analysts, task force officers, and many support personnel. We have deployed over 200 employees from across the FBI to Las Vegas, including many with specialized positions. Globally, we have hundreds of agents covering every facet of this investigation. Nothing will be overlooked. We have made significant progress. To date, we have found no signs of ideology or affiliation to any groups. Hundreds of interviews have been conducted so far. Close to 2,000 leads have been covered so far. Extensive review of digital media on a multitude of devices is ongoing. Over a thousand pieces of evidence have been collected and are being reviewed by the FBI laboratory. Hours and hours of video footage from hotels continues to be reviewed. FBI victim specialists from across the country are here assisting victims and families of the victims. More than 1,800 victim questionnaires have been completed and the return of personal property continues. We continue, <clears throat> we continue to ask you if you have factual information in furtherance of this investigation, please call us. If you know something, say something. The number is 1-800-CALL-FBI. The FBI, nor our partner, we don't rush to conclusions. We ask for your patience and will not comment on specifics of this investigation while it is in process. This is in keeping with the long-standing FBI tradition. As I said from the beginning, this is our city. It is your city. Las Vegas is a resilient city, a microcosm of a resilient nation. While we grieve as a community, we will use that energy to learn as much as we can about this horrible crime so that we may prevent another one from happening. I thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Um, so before we close out today, I, I want to provide you another written narrative. I want to read verbatim um, in support. In other words, bring a better light to what's occurred and the carnage that is associated with our community. There's some bright spots, and I don't want anybody to take offense when I've completed my comments today. There's a thousand heroes out there, but I'm going to bring it home to my department, and I think it's important for you to hear it. So the first narrative, in the immediate aftermath of the shooting, Sergeant Garrett Everett arrived at Reno in Haven and saw the need for medical triage area. For hours, Sergeant Ebert and other LVMPD officers, along with the off-duty nurses, paramedics, and firefighters, triaged at least 50 gunshot victims. They ran out of tourniquets and began using anything they could find to stop the bleeding, to include their own hobble devices they used during normal course of their duties. These officers calmly took care of the wounded and the dying as they waited for medical transport at times placing the critical victims on the backs of trucks so they could get them to the hospital quickly. Not all the victims made it out as the night wore on. Those same officers were assigned to guard the deceased victims, not allowing any of them to be left alone. 
So the under sheriff and myself, Kevin McMahill, took it upon herself to go out and visit some of my officers yesterday um, to discuss their mental state, to thank them, and check on their overall condition. These particular officers sustained some substantial wounds, and some of them you have heard in the public forum already, and some you haven't. But there's a couple key individuals I want you to write about. And one of them is Brady Cook. Uh, Brady uh, sustained four separate gunshot wounds. And when I say separate, that's entries and exits. It's not actually four separate bullets. And his important piece on Brady is the suspect was firing upon the crowd. As our officers started to arrive via vehicles, which Brady was occupying one, it is readily apparent to me that he adjusted his fire and directed it toward the police vehicles. So the response of those individuals, I believe, saved lives. No matter what his personal vendetta is against the police or not, maybe he was preventing the wolf from getting to his door sooner than later, um, but he chose to fire upon the police vehicles. Uh, Brady sustained a substantial wound to his shoulder, uh, through his bicep, into his chest, and out his back. And the reason why I bring this one up, he asked me if he could go back to work today. Samuel Whitworth, excuse me for my emotion. Samuel was laying on his couch with a very in intensive wound to his leg. During the melee, in his attempt to evacuate victims, he sustained a broken leg. But he remained on scene and provided security for the medical personnel. So at this point, I want to thank the community. I want to thank you for letting me be your sheriff. And Vegas strong. Thank you. No question. What time did MDM call police? I still haven't made that out. If the officers were there in the scene, why did it take them 12 minutes to get a full search?